Yovan Buha. Buha. Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to episode four of Buha's Block. I am pleased to be joined by one of my favorite people in the business, athletic senior national NBA writer. I, I was trying to figure out the best way to, to do your title, but Sam Amick, uh, one of my favorites. Sam, how are you doing today? Yo, Vaughn, what's up, my guy? Great to see you. This is the first time ever that I, uh, I'm so happy to hear that like the way you intro the pod with the yo, 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 Vaughn, like that's how I call you when I call you. And I've always felt kind of corny dropping it because I figured you get it everywhere you go. So I'm, I'm glad that that is endorsed by the man himself. Happy to be on the pod. Appreciate you. Like I said, off air, you are a, uh, an always willing participant on the tampering pod and, uh, and happy to, to give it back for once. Yeah. It feels weird to be on, on this side of it. Typically I'm, I'm the guest, but, uh, happy to, to host you. And, uh, I feel like this is the perfect week to have you on just because, uh, the Lakers just played the Kings. They lost 120 to 107. And then they have a, a big game with the Warriors this weekend. That's kind of your vortex of the three sure. teams. I mean, you're, you're a national <laughs> right. writer. You, you, you cover the whole league, but you are a Bay Area guy. You live in Sacramento. Uh, so you're familiar with the Kings. You're familiar with the Warriors. You obviously have uh, ties with the Lakers. So felt like the right time to, to bring you on and get into some of this stuff. But uh, last night, again, Lakers lose to the Kings, 120 to 107. Kings sweep the season series. DeMontis Sabonis puts up a, his 23rd triple-double league leading, but second against the Lakers in the past week. Uh, LeBron, AD, and D'Lo combined to shoot 5 for 22 in the first half. Uh, really struggled through the first three quarters uh, before LeBron and AD started to kind of figure it out uh, later in the fourth. Uh, Lakers drop a, a game that they came in, calling it a must win. Uh, they had two days to prepare. Uh, the Kings were coming. It was a home back to back for them. They just came off uh, a win over the Bucks. So like there were no excuses. The Lakers couldn't point to, to rest or preparation right. or, or injury. Like Kings also lost a couple guys in that Bucks game. Uh, Kevin Herter, uh, their starting shooting guard, what was out Trey Lyles. Um, so like, what is your take on, or, or how do you view uh, last night's game, and, and then to a larger extent, like the the season series between the Lakers and the Kings? So for me, the word that comes to mind is bizarre, um, and I'll start from the Kings' perspective, and it's bizarre because they've had this roller coaster Jekyll and Hyde season where they are capable of beating good teams, they lose to bad teams pretty frequently. Their fans have been really frustrated. Um, so after they beat Milwaukee the night before and their fans are yet again saying, man, we can't figure this team out. You are kind of feeling like, okay, Lakers come in. It's a back to back. Like you said, the Lakers had some rest. Um, even though the Kings had played well in the first three games, you're down Kevin Herter. You and, and the Kings fans, I think are programmed to assume that the second something good happens, then it's always followed by something bad. So the way they dominated that game did surprise me. Uh, the stakes that you detailed, you know, clearly weren't enough to compel the Lakers to put their best foot forward. Now I went to shoot around and saw you the morning of the game. And you know, even that, like the Kings didn't have a shoot around because they played the night before. And you had LeBron and AD talking at shoot around, uh, which doesn't happen very often. And the mood was good, and, and but the basketball was not for them. Um, the, the matchup is, it's wild to, to think that they went 0-4 against the Kings. You know, that's like just absolute, pure dopamine for Kings fans to have that, you know, on their home floor, they were so happy to see the Sabonis get the best of AD again. Obviously that matchup is now, you know, 10 0 in Sabonis's favor. So um, bad matchup for the Lakers, bad step backwards in the standings uh, and like the Kings, you know, a tough team to figure out. Yeah. And, and my lead last night was there was that play late in the third quarter where the Sabonis uh, he, he's bringing the ball up in transition. He tries to kind of drive on AD. AD cuts him off. He stops. He pivots. He does a little head fake. AD's right there. And then he just bulldozes through him, right. lays the ball in. Um, I thought it was an offensive foul. It, it didn't get called, so is what it is. Uh, but AD falls to the ground. He's holding his face. And LeBron and Spencer Dinwiddie walk over to check on him. And there's a ref right there. That was the closest ref to the play. They kind of complained to him. Darvin Ham is next to a ref. He starts complaining. And then the Lakers just didn't really do anything after that. And like, 
Um, uh, maybe I'm old school with it or, or, you know, uh, whatever, but like, I felt like the Lakers just didn't match the Kings physicality and force. Sure. And, and I think Sabonis versus AD is the best example of that. And, and that was the headline of my story. I think it was something, um, along the lines of like Sabonis plays bully ball against AD, but that, that play to me, like, yes, it, it could have been an offensive foul, should have been an offensive foul. Sure. But it wasn't called. And, right. and to me, it was just the fact like. It was the, more the, the symbolism of Sabonis powering through AD. AD falls. He's holding his face. Sabonis is running back, roaring and flexing. And that was basically the season series between these two teams. Like, that was how it went. And whether it was the Kings' speed or, or their shooting or whatever, like, the, the Lakers just couldn't figure it out. And the one thing they could kind of figure out what was their effort and, and their physicality. And they just never really matched the Kings. And, and the other thing for me was, like, I thought their their defense was inexcusable at times. Like I went back and watched all the Kings three point makes, and I will say part of it what was almost half of it was on LeBron and just yeah. his, his effort defensively yeah. was you know not closing out to guys, not getting around screens, botching switches. Like it was just for for a game that they again like LeBron and AD spoke at shoot around. That's how you knew it was a big game. Those guys right. rarely speak at shoot around in general. But also, you know, to, to both speak, not together, but like back to back, like right. it was a big game and, and they both laid out the stakes. And like, I don't know, it was just kind of weird to see, like, because this, this group has, and you, you've been around them, like you, you make your trips out to LA. This group prides itself on being like, hey, we might not be the best team in the regular season. We might be a play in team, whatever. But like when we need to turn it on, when when the stakes are high, we can rise to the occasion. And like you looking at last year's playoff run or the in season tournament. And they, they've done that recently with, with this stretch that, you know, they, they've won 12 of 18. They, they've been trying to, to ascend in the standings. The West is just brutal. But, like, it was just kind of shocking to see this group with, with, the, with so much time to prepare and, and the stakes so clear just not really be able to meet the moment. And I, I do wonder, this could just be a bad matchup, and I think it is. And it, Sacramento's kind of like Denver Jr. with – Sabonis so and the handoffs and and just but that not to cut you off that doesn't change okay. anything that you're saying you know what I mean like yeah it, even if it's a bad matchup you can and I don't mean to sound too like Neanderthal old school but like you can get pissed you know AD can get pissed he can he can decide yeah. that it's, it's it's about to be zero and ten and I think uh, to go a little deeper with it I'd be curious to get your perspective on ad you know i've always found it so interesting that you know lebron is so defensive of ad I, I found when he talks about him when he you know he he occasionally will tell the media make sure that that we know that ad does not care what any of us or the fans say about him and that's sometimes i think a weird flex like okay well this right now you've got this matchup against this one particular player who is just absolutely dominating you um you know as a quick aside this cracked me up there's a sacramento Radio host, buddy of mine named Carmichael Dave posted a picture of the play you talked about where you have Domas flexing as he goes down the floor, AD in the background just wrecked on the ground, Kings fans celebrating everywhere, and his caption was like, put this in the Louvre. Like it made their day, it made their year. And AD, it's it's at the expense of AD. So he didn't get angry in you know that moment. I actually went out of my way as you know, we sit at the top of the lower bowl in that arena. I went out of my way to try to study his his immediate reaction after that play. I even bring binoculars to these games, and I was right on AD, and it's like, man, he's just licking his wounds. He's not looking at Sabonis, maybe chirping about how you know that should have been an offensive foul or was too much or whatever. He just licked his wounds, went back to the bench, and, and that spirit did carry on from there. And then the larger question is, I know – you know, people think at times that that AD is, you know, on the short list of most scrutinized guys in the league, you know, and it's because of what we know his ceiling to be, but it's just, it wasn't a great look. And I think, you know, the LeBron stuff you mentioned is, is fair game as well. Um, I, I caught some of those possessions where one of them up top, I forget which quarter, but it was first half. De'Aaron is coming down the floor. LeBron like jumped out to the assignment. And my first thought was like, okay, so he's going to be the head of the snake and try to slow the, the Kings down a little bit, and he just died on a screen, like didn't even try, and and De'Aaron buries the three, uh, and that's how it was for a lot of the night. So, yeah, I mean, it's only one game, but they didn't look like a team that, that was ready to to kind of recreate what they did last year in the in the conference finals run. 
Well, and I think the, the other part to it too is just like they had the same situation happen last week. Like they, yeah. they were, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a rest situation, but it was like they were hyping up the Kings matchup. And, and at the time, uh, they, they were two games back. They had a chance if they won that game and then won this game to win the season series against the Kings, have the tiebreaker, and with a couple of extra wins and a couple of Kings losses, uh, potentially pass them in the standings. <clears throat> But you can kiss that goodbye. The Kings are now up four games in the loss column on the Lakers, uh, basically five if you include the tiebreaker because of the season series. So, like, the Kings are going to be ahead of the Lakers in the standings. And now the Lakers, if you're starting to look at the, the West playoff picture, they're kind of like eighth might be their ceiling right now because New Orleans is playing great. Phoenix is continuing to win and, and get a little healthier. The Kings, again, as I just said, are going to likely be at, almost certainly going to be ahead of them barring a collapse. Uh, so it's really looking like 8 9 10 Dallas Lakers Golden State in some order depending right. on what what happens with, with those three teams. Uh which brings me to just the general state of the Lakers. Uh so since January 1st they are 19 and 14, which is tied for 7th best record in the West, 10th best record in the NBA overall, which kind of shows how deep the West is that seven of the top 10 best records over the past two and a half months come from the West, sure. uh, but they're 12th in offense, 26th in defense. So that's been a trend recently where they won the in-season tournament playing these kind of big wing lineups, not a lot of shooting, not a lot of spacing. They're really good defensively, but they can barely score. Now it's been the opposite for going on two plus months of they've been a top 10 offense for the most part, but they can't defend anybody. And, and you kind of saw that last night, uh, but, 16th in that rating, so about league average. One game ahead of the Warriors, two and a half games behind the Mavericks. Like, where are you at in general with the Lakers and their ability to potentially ascend in the standings over these next few weeks and just their their kind of playoff outlook uh, as they prepare for the play-in tournament? Yeah, I mean, it is a different look than what they were doing last year. Last year, the defense was the calling card. Darvin Ham, like that, that fit in really well with his profile and what he had sold to get the job initially um now the identity you know is a little more mismatched you know you think about to me they have these individual success stories during this season that you can highlight and, and give your flowers to so delo plays so well heading into the trade deadline has played well since you know i think the optics and, and the narrative around d'angelo has improved quite a bit and that's fine but then you know like you just hit on like that's going to come with a defensive cost that has a ripple effect on the team. You look at LeBron, who will get more into his situation later, but individually, incredible season uh, when you talk about the age and, and the history and, and all that stuff. Um, but it's not necessarily impacting winning in the way that it has in the past. And then AD, you know, has fallen off, I think, a bit lately, but has had a strong year. Yeah, if you had like a power rankings of teams that had, you know, a bunch of individual success stories but the collective wasn't where they wanted it to be. They'd probably be on that short list because um, it doesn't really, I don't think track, at least not as of now to an imposing postseason contender. It just doesn't, um, you know, if it ends up being Lakers warriors in the play in, that's going to be wild. You might have Steph and LeBron, you know, just at the bottom end of the play in tournament. Um, the vibes are strange. You're so much closer to it than I am, but even the short time around them yesterday, certainly picked up on some of that stuff, you know, like D'Angelo's post game comments when he was asked about Rui Hachimura only getting one shot in the second half. And D'Angelo says he doesn't want to go there, you know, presumably not wanting to be critical of the coaching staff. Um, so he chooses to basically no comment. This comes on the same day when Dave McMenamin at ESPN had the story with D'Angelo, you know, really candidly telling the story about, about how he wasn't, close enough to Darwin last year because of the relationship he had with Dennis Schroeder. I'm, I'm giving you this whole broad scope of Lakers context, I guess. Um, it's all Keep a going. little funky. Yeah, but it's just, it's just funky. It's the synergy is not there um, right now, um, but it is weird to observe and cover and report on because again, like they, they still, it's a hell, it's a weird con. It's a hell of a lot better than some of the late Kobe years when they were just irrelevant and and nothing was going for them. Um, so it's a matter of like when we get to the bigger picture conversation later, the question is going to become, it, you know, what do the Lakers want? Is is it still title or bust because that's the franchise's history? 
or during this unique LeBron chapter, is it okay to just be entertaining on most nights, have some good stuff for the fans to enjoy, um, and, and and ride that train until the end? I think that's kind of the key question. I'm in a weird place with them. Uh, I, I did uh, Spectrum Sports Night, the Lakers TV channel earlier this week, and what we we did a fill in the blank, uh, you know, portion of the show. And one of the questions was like, the Lakers season has been blank, and I chose confounding because I feel like every time I'm in on this team, they have a loss like last night, and then I start to all right, like I'm giving up. Like I I just I, I don't believe it. I don't see it. And then they beat the Bucks and the Timberwolves back to back, and they kind of reel you back in. And it's just been this roller coaster of a season uh, where you see the highs. And again, the in season tournament, they they're three and one against the Clippers. They're three and one against the Thunder. Uh, they're one and two against the Timberwolves. But one of those losses uh, could have been an overtime game, where, where or, or I mean a, a win where LeBron hits that three, but it's ruled the two. Uh, they had another loss to the Timberwolves that was close without LeBron. So like they, they've played aside from Denver and Sacramento, they've basically the three two advantage over the Suns. Like they played the the top teams in the West well. Like I, I think. You can make a case that like any of those teams would probably be favored over the Lakers just because of home court advantage and, and the track record of the season. But like if you told me the Lakers beat the Thunder or the Timberwolves in round one, especially now with the Carl Anthony Towns injury, like I would not be surprised whatsoever. So like I still see the ceiling there of a team that could win a round or two, depending on you know, like things would have to go right for them in terms of like the bracket, the matchups and, and whatnot. But like, I still see that ceiling, but I also see sure. a team that could easily lose in the nine ten game. And I don't know, like maybe Golden State is the, the closest parallel there where, you know, they could go on their own run or or they could lose to the Lakers or the Mavericks in the plan. But like the, the, the ceiling and the floor are, are just so far apart that uh, you really just don't know what, what you're going to get. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you, you hit on, uh, several, several interesting things there with, with this group. And like last night, I mean, it continues to kind of happen where when they win, everything's great. And, and that tends to be the case in the NBA, but when they lose the subtle finger pointing and the veiled shots, and it, it's really like you go through Darvin Ham's press conference and, and his transcripts, it's a lot of energy and effort and multiple rotations and next play mentality and like for better or worse he's essentially putting it on the players and their effort their ability to execute their ability to follow the game plan and then you listen to the the, the players say certain things and it starts to get into the scheme and the game plan and their preparation and like it's just kind of this back and forth between the two sides and i thought it was interesting with with uh you know the the Dilo story and sort of the things that were discussed in that and then you kind of saw it play out sort of post game with again like you know him not wanting to touch on the offense it was just kind of a weird like th this tends to be the case and again I, I know like no NBA locker room is happy uh, after a loss but with the Lakers like this is my sixth season as a beat reporter and 12th season covering the league overall and like I can't remember as many like passive aggressive veiled shots in post game press conferences as seems to happen after every Lakers loss. And, uh, you know, I, sometimes I feel like I'm crazy and I, like I'm the only one picking up on it. I know fans will pick up sure. on certain things and like tweet it out, but like there's other things that like I pick up on and I'm like, is no one else seeing this? Like I, I right, but it right, seemed right. like you picked up on some of those vibes. Yeah, for sure. And I think it's probably worth reminding. I know this is a, a, a hardcore Lakers fan base on your pod, but even with that being the case, reminding people that if you go back to the first couple months of the season, you know, you and I and, and our colleague Sham Sharania had reported at length about Darvin Ham's situation. And and if we're being real, some of that Laker Nation was coming for our next acting as if we were overstating the sensitive nature of that situation. We weren't. You know what I mean? Like that was real at the time. And and I think one thing people might have forgotten about is I don't think those dynamics are gone. They're just not. Um, and I'm talking specifically about, you know, the degree to which Darwin has the locker room, which parts of the locker room he has or may not have. Um, you know, you see these different uh, moments that wind up going viral on social media. And this one's old at this point, but where it's like, 
you know, Darvin going to congratulate LeBron and LeBron keeps walking and it's just weird. Like you said, little, whether it's passive aggressiveness or just vibe moments that are tough to ignore, um, that, that's going that stuff is going to bubble back to the surface after losses, when there is struggle, when there's frustration. Um, so, you know, the organization has clearly made a choice that Darwin is the guy they, their messaging has been that they knew when they hired him, that he was a young coach who was going to need time to grow. They kind of withstood what, you know, the strong indications that, that, you know, the most important players on this team might not have been thrilled at a certain point, but the, you know, they, they didn't, no change was made, you know what I mean? And so here they are with an element of uncomfortableness, I think that at times remains not all the time. Um, but they seem a little bit split personality in terms of that dynamic and that relationship. So that's, what's going to lead to everything that you're seeing. Um, you know, and we'll see where it all leads. I mean, we are talking, I guess, quickly to address like the, the, the variants, uh, of the Lakers in that you mentioned, it's not any different than most of the West. It's, I can't ever remember a year where so many teams fit the profile that you just described in terms of if you told me that they won a first round matchup, I wouldn't be shocked. If you told me they got swept in the first round, I wouldn't be shocked. There's a lot of teams like that. The Kings are one of them just because I saw them last night. They come to mind. Um, it's going to make for a fascinating. The, the difference I, with the Lakers is that they're in ninth. So like they're at risk of just like not even making the playoffs. hundred percent. That's where yeah. like that, that tough December stretch really hurt them uh, yeah. where, you know, they go from, they win the in-season tournament and they're fourth in the West. And then basically since late December, they've been a playing team. Yeah. And, and the unique thing for them that I'm kind of repeating myself, but it is like the pomp and circumstance with them has been on a different level because they won the in-season tournament because LeBron got into the 40,000 point barrier, you know, first time in, in league history, nobody's ever done that. You have all these celebratory moments when the spotlight was on them and it was a positive story it was a you know the lakers have something going here um they've had a disproportionate amount of of like public positivity i guess for a team that has performed the way they have if that makes sense and so yep. it makes for a it makes for a, a, a like you said your word was confounding it does for sure make for a, a confounding experience you mentioned 40,000 points and this is a perfect segue uh, you recently wrote about LeBron crossing that 40,000 point threshold and you you compared it to growing up a Jordan fan and Jordan being this, I mean, being the, the goat for many people, being untouchable. And, and then you kind of contrasted that with LeBron and, and his longevity and, and how um, it, it's maybe changed your perspective a little bit. Uh, so I, I don't want to spoil the, the story. People can read it on The Athletic, uh, but you briefly spoke about it with LeBron at shoot around yesterday. Uh, so I, I know you can't get into everything that was said or, or shared, but um, can, can you share with us just a little bit about that story and your conversation with LeBron yesterday? Yeah. And I don't mind sharing the conversation was harmless. It was all positive. Um, the, the column and I enjoyed writing it cause I don't pull this card very often was, you know, uh, and pull the curtain back all the way. Our editors had hit us up on the national side heading into that event. Everybody knew 40,000 was coming basically said, Hey, does anybody have any, any, you know, column ideas or thoughts they want to share? Just, are you feeling anything on this topic? And right out the gate, I wasn't. And it, it kind of snuck up on me like, okay, I mean, he's already the all time scoring leader. I guess we're going to, you know, highlight the fact that he got to 40,000, but it's just a number. That was my initial reaction. The more I kind of chewed on it, it, it just started blowing me away a little bit more the more I processed it. So then I start digging into the research and you know, the one thing, and this is, you know, something we already knew, but looking at it really struck me. And this kind of led me to want to write was the idea that in the history of the game, um, you're talking about six players total um, NBA, not including ABA, Dr. J would otherwise be in this category, but six players who had gotten to 30,000 points out of all the players in the history of the league. And it's just that framing and that context and, and the premise being that just by getting to 30,000, like, man, we should call all six of them goats. You know what I mean? Like they're incredible. That is the, the cream of the crop. Uh, I think I did the math on that six in comparison to how many players. And I forget the number in the history of the league. It was like 0.0012%. 
it's not even just the top 1%. It's like you are among the best. So the idea that LeBron would not only be in the 30,000 point club, but find a way to go all the way to 40 blew me away. So I write a piece where the other, you know, unique thing was I was going to share and I'd never really done this. I was going to share my own MJ fandom. And I know I'm not unique in that regard. I grew up in the eighties. Um, but I was a massive, massive M MJ fan. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay. The Warriors were my team when I was young, you know, Tim Hardaway, Mitch Richmond, Chris Mullen, they were like, I wrote, they were fun. But then when Michael took over the league, I was all in on Michael, man, I wanted to move to Chicago. Like I was so in on his game and what he represented. Uh, I even shared a, a story in the column that, that admittedly was fun to write because it's nostalgia. How, when I was in middle school, uh, my late mother, you know, talking about mother of the year, she takes me across the country to Kansas, halfway across the country to go to a Roy Williams basketball camp. But my incentive was because Michael Jordan was going to make an appearance. So like, you know, and this was a big deal for me at the time. I'm in the middle of nowhere and I'm just trying to catch a glimpse of, of MJ. So my point in sharing all that was I have always been very reluctant to give LeBron any goat status. And I, and I didn't give him that in the column. My point is this, their stories have become so wildly different that I'm done with the conversation. And I just think, you know, I know it sounds like the, you know, political stance to take, but, I, but it's genuine. I just think it's time to give both of them the equal amount of flowers. Their stories are too different to continue comparing them. Michael misses four seasons, you know, uh, during his, you know, ends up playing 14 years, but he missed four entire seasons. Obviously his father tragically gets murdered. Uh, you know, the, that inspires the first retirement retires a second time, but his story is so different. He never did anything remotely close to what LeBron is doing at this age, at this stage, you know, and don't forget Michael's wizards years, those two wizards years, for the most part, were celebrated because at that age, he was very productive. They didn't make the playoffs, but we had such a different standard for what a player at that age could do that, that we still celebrated what Michael was able to do with the Wizards. But now, the part where you have to start shifting to LeBron and saying, my God, like start appreciating what he's doing. I mean, LeBron's blowing that out of the water. Like It's nothing, you know, what he's doing right now, what he did last year, what he'll probably do next year is just head and shoulders above what Michael or even Kareem or anybody else was able to do at this age. So it was just an appreciation column. Um, so then when I see him at shoot around yesterday, um, and I, again, not normally my style, I, I decided to just say hello. And, and uh, I basically told him, Hey, I don't know if you saw it. You probably didn't, but I wrote about you last week and pardon the, you know, the language kids at home. But I, I looked at him and I said, dude, 40,000 is fucking wild. Like it's just wild. And he laughed and I said, I'm just, I'm just blown away. I told him the MJ thing because I assumed he hadn't seen the column. I said, I wrote about you last week and I just kind of shared that like I was a huge MJ, MJ guy. It's pretty tough for me to, to start even talking about you in the same sentence. And I was like, dude, but I'm, I'm done. Like what you have done, what you continue to do is incredible. And so, I mean, he was, you know, he's appreciative. He, he you know, he laughed and smiled and said, thank you. Um, seemed like he was still kind of soaking up the fact that everything he's accomplished, I'm sure it does feel good that, that people don't nitpick all the time with him. Like they used to, you know what I mean? Like the way we talk about LeBron has changed. Um, there was a time when I'm sure he felt like it didn't matter what he did. You know, we were going to find fault with it. So, um, yeah, I enjoyed writing it and the dude's incredible, man. I mean, you, you know, we were talking about him dying on screens and all these different things that you know, he's, he's not perfect, but, but he's doing some, some incredible things right now. You just dropped the first F bomb, uh, in <laughs> block history. So, so thank you for, uh, popping my expletive cherry. Now, now I can start freely, <laughs> freely cursing on here. Um, but, but I did it sheepishly playing. by the way, because my 14 year old is like in the other room. And so I was no offense. I love you. I was assuming he wasn't going to hear the pod. I, I was hoping he didn't hear his dad in here dropping f-bombs but you know <laughs> no, but that was but that was the moment and you yeah, know it, it and i did like it was a choice too because it's like it, lebron is i mean i don't see him that often i don't connect with him that often you know he knows who i am we've done some decent stuff in the past interview wise but 
it was a little bit like, all right, let's just be blunt with what I'm trying to convey to him. Uh, and, and he yeah. got a chuckle out of it. And, and then you, you keep setting me up for transitions here just because uh, you mentioned LeBron next year and the Lakers have a, an important, well, and LeBron, both sides have an important decision to make this summer. But LeBron has a $51.4 million player option for next season. Uh, there are several ways that he can handle it. He can opt in. Uh, he can opt in and extend. He can opt out and re-sign, or he can opt out and sign with a another team. And the numbers here quickly are an extension would be about three years, 164 million, factoring uh, in that 51.4 uh, million dollar contract for for next season. So he'd be extending a couple years on top of that. Uh, re-signing would be three years, 162 million, and a new deal with another team would be about three years, 157 million. So somewhere in that three years, $160 million range, give or take either way. One uh, advantage for him, if he does uh, decline the option and re-sign with the Lakers is he could uh, have a no trade clause, which at this point, if the Lakers are committing to him via re-signing or extending, theoretically, they're not gonna be trading him. Uh, so, but still something nice to, to always have in, in your contract. Uh, but with the LeBron topic of, of this offseason, and I mean, the, there's still the whole Bronny conversation, which is its own discussion. But putting that aside, um, in terms of just what LeBron's going to do, what the Lakers are going to do, what you think both sides should do, um, where are you at right now with LeBron and this offseason and, and the path that he's headed on and kind of the pros and cons from the Lakers side? I think it's... Um it feels like it's evolved uh, even recently a little bit. So if you go back to his, you know, wildly, in my opinion, wildly entertaining kind of like social media slash in-person passive aggressive tour, like a month ago, the trip to New York where it's the Knicks colored shoes and it's the hourglass tweet. And it's the video where, you know, it's King James in New York. He's screaming at the camera, whatever he had said. And it was like, okay, we get it. Like, you know, you're looking at greener pastures and possible non Lakers options. And you're clearly considering the option of, you know, again, these are just my takeaways. A lot of people's takeaways, you know, considering the option of, of, uh, of opting out this summer and doing something else, um, whether it's the Knicks or, or whatever else at that time, you had every reason to believe like, man, where is, uh, LeBron's relationship with the Lakers? Where is this all going? Um, I don't know if you want to get into this at all, but like, how does the Bronny factor come into play? There was just a lot. And at minimum, you felt like, okay, like he, we know his personality. We know the way he he handles messaging. And, and often it's not direct. It is, you know, somewhat passive aggressive like this. So whatever the reason, all is not well. That was the feeling. Um, now you fast forward. I think the stuff that's evolved uh, is for one, you know, King's loss, notwithstanding a little bit of stabilizing of the team's performance and where they might be going and their relevancy in this season that matters. Uh, Bronny not playing very well at USC, at least in terms of when you're talking about being a, an actual NBA prospect, you know, first round um, handicaps are gone. Second round handicaps are likely gone. And, and so that is a game changer there because also the conversation rightfully has shifted to uh like okay let the young man find like find his way basketball wise let him have his journey especially after going through his heart situation which was a major scare for the family uh it feels like that aspect has settled down it feels like you know especially when you see i mean in, i'm going to compartmentalize the social media silliness that came with this but the lebron moment with genie bus i i did think was was substantive you know when he decides to go over and visit with Jeannie, uh, you know, courtside at, at Laker games. And as you know, as well as anybody, she doesn't sit right on the court. She's got her section like one row back and correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, has he ever gone over there that you have ever seen in his time with the Lakers? I want to say he's gone over once um, and, and the, the context, but, but not in that manner. And the context I'll, I'll provide quickly is that uh, right there along the baseline kind of perpendicular, to her seats are Rich Paul seats. So LeBron will often come uh, during timeouts if, if it's a game where he's not playing 
and he's at the arena. He'll come over and talk with Rich briefly. Rich always has someone that's sitting with him uh, on those baseline seats. So, you know, sometimes it's uh, in, uh, another NBA player like Trey Young has sat in, in those seats before. Sometimes it's uh, an Kyrie. NFL prospect. I mean, Kyrie, uh, you know, the, but Clutch has expanded into the NFL. So sometimes they'll bring players like just giving right. the context of, of there's, there's always kind of someone in those seats. So LeBron will come over, say hi to Rich, say hi to whoever is sitting there. And so what happened was the, the context before that, which I, I don't know how many people know, uh, was he came over and said hi to Rich and they were talking for about a minute, minute, uh, minute and a half. And then he beelined over to Jeannie and it was kind of wild because he went basically into the stands like that is not connected to the court that is off the court. Uh, right. And then you had fans like uh, and again, you can't really see this based on the TV angle, but you had fans like coming out of their seats and like walking into the aisle to try and get close to LeBron security had to had to keep them at bay, uh, but to take photos to take videos. And it was just this wild scene of it was like a three minute timeout. So this all happened within like a three minute span of he comes over to Rich, people start to notice him. Oh, it's LeBron, it's LeBron, like yelling stuff out. He walks out, sits next to Jeannie uh, and Linda Rambis and has this moment with them that goes absolutely viral. People are lip reading it, uh, the, the happy International Women's Day. And, uh, you know, just it was it was a t like that all happened in three minutes and it was just a totally wild scene and also a very Lakers uh, scene right. of just like the, the star power that is walking around at any moment. Well, and again, I'm going to highlight the evolution of this conversation because if you take that Im uh, imagery and that vibe and that dynamic and and try to reconcile that with all of the messaging that was happening during the New York time, those are two very different things. And this is just me talking, but generally speaking, if you asked me, you know, what my current thoughts were on uh, the relationship between Jeannie and LeBron, I think there are times when it seems as if you know, she decides to to make sure she runs the organization in the way that she promised he would or she would when he came to town and that that is her fulfilling her responsibility. But in terms of like the connectivity, it has felt like there are a lot of times when she might not know exactly where his head is at, how he might be feeling. Uh, and I think honestly, as it relates to some of the social media stuff and the different messaging he had put out there, I think her her kind of personal policy had been you know, that I'm going to trust that if, if he needs to talk, we're going to have a meeting and we're going to have, she likes direct communication. So to then see that kind of interaction, uh, I took, I saw it as, as progress. And I also saw it as, as, you know, I'm not trying to take anything away from it, but pretty shrewd political operating on LeBron's part. Like it's, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like he, it feels as if he is, you know, like gravitating more towards saying, you know what, let's keep the Laker chapter going. Um, but you know, his entire career, he has always pushed for max money and he deserves it. And so that, you know, that now is the conversation you got to get, uh, you know, clarity from the Lakers. Um, are you willing to do three for 164, 162, whatever it ends up being? Um, and so we'll see, you know, what happens when the summer comes along, but that dynamic seems uh, to be good. But the thing you can't answer now is how does the team finish? Um, that's going to play a big part. Um, if we're being honest, like, okay. in and within that context is, you know, what's the coaching situation looking like? Uh, what are the feelings and the opinions on that front? Again, when the summer hits, if they are, you know, underwhelmed or, or frustrated by the way things ended. So you can't, you just can't really figure out what direction it's going to ultimately go. But in terms of the personal dynamics, uh, again, I thought that moment was, was uh, significant. Yeah, I mean, I, I basically agree with everything you just said. Uh, I think it, it's simply to me like this seems to be trending in the direction of LeBron resigning or ex you know opting in and extending. Um, from my understanding, uh, on both sides, be it the the Lakers side and LeBron in, in in his camp, both sides want him to be a Laker through the rest of his career, and I, I think that's gonna be what happens. And, and again, there are other variables there, there's Bronny, there is the way that this season goes. Um, and some of the, the stuff with the off season in terms of the coaching stuff or uh, pursuing a, a third star. Uh, but even with that, I, I think both sides uh, have enjoyed the partnership, uh, even through some of the rockiness recently. And I, I just I don't see 
I, I don't want to say I don't see any way he's not a Laker at some point, you know, over, over the next few years. But I, I do think uh, if, if you're setting the the odds, I, I would make it a, a heavy favorite that LeBron is a Laker through the next few years and likely retires as a Laker, barring just him maybe wanting to play like one season with Bronny to, to close out his career or, or go back to Cleveland or whatever. But like, I, I think realistically, it's it's going to be closing out his career in L.A., um, and from like, I've seen people push back against it of, do you want to pay LeBron 50, 60 million at age 41, age 42? Like I understand that. And it's easy to bring up the, the Kobe comparison of the Lakers signing him to that two year, uh, $48 million contract at the end of his career coming off the Achilles, uh, rupture and, and, um, that surgery and, and that kind of setback late in his career. But LeBron hasn't had an injury like that. He's continuing to play at a borderline all NBA level. It was, it was a clear all star this year. And until we see that precipitous drop from him, I, I just think you, you, you have to pay him and, you know, maybe it, it does set a cap on the Lakers ceiling over the next couple of years of, you know, even with LeBron and AD being healthy this season, they've been a nine seed. And part of that's on, on those two, part of that's on the coaching staff, part of that's on the roster and, and some of the limitations. And then part of it's also on, injuries and and how loaded the west has been like if, if this was last year uh, i think i don't know off the top of my head but i assume the lakers would not be a nine seed with this current record last season i think they'd probably be like a six or seven seed uh but right. that's just you know the, the west has been healthier the west has been better and it, it just you know it, it is what it is ultimately but um i think you you have to do it with lebron and the, the lakers pride themselves on taking care of stars and, and you can criticize that uh or, or you can praise it but like that's just what that's just part of you know what inherently makes the Lakers the Lakers. And again, I, I look at like what's the alternative, right? Like the like free agency isn't what it it used to be. You rarely see stars leave in, in free agency uh the, the way that you know that LeBron kind of started it in twenty ten with, with the player empowerment movement and, and guys kind of dictating where they were going more and, and and you know hopping team to team. Uh but you also like and then you look at the trade market and it's not like the Lakers uh, have this war chest of assets. Like maybe they're they're able to cobble um you know assets together this summer to get a third star. But like looking ahead, if LeBron leaves uh, you could generate some cap space, but you're not replacing LeBron with a LeBron level guy in, in free agency. And then trying to muster, you know, D maybe D'Angelo opts in or, or, you know, you sign up to a new deal and, and you could try and trade him at like the trade deadline and, and like D'Lo Austin and like picks. Like, I, I don't know what that's ultimately getting you. That's better than having LeBron even at age 40 or, or 41. So from the Lakers side, I know there's going to be people who are against it. I know there's going to be people who who are saying, you know, don't sign him or, or sign him to a one year deal or two years max, whatever. But like, I just think, again, the alternative is like, remember what it was like in between the end of the Kobe era and the beginning of the LeBron era. Like it was some dark days for the Lakers. Right. They right. they missed the playoffs. They weren't very relevant. You know, I think this this alternative to me is much better, even if even if it doesn't ultimately result in a championship. And, and I know every Lakers season is championship or bust. Like I, I still think having LeBron, having AD, having at least a shot. And if you can figure out that third star, or if you can figure out a different way to build the roster or, or rebuild it rather this summer, like that to me is a more interesting and, and just fun path for the fan base rather than yeah. let's tear it down. Let's have <laughs> a couple of rebuilding years around AD. Like I, I just, I, I don't think that makes sense. Couple of quick follows, all good perspective. Um, there's not another option out there that has gotten louder for LeBron. I think that's a factor. Like I reported in the wake of the New York stuff that in, we're only as good as what we're told at that time. But at that time, the Knicks front office had not discussed the prospect of putting a plan together to pursue LeBron at all. Like this was not on their radar. They are a Jalen Brunson, you know, working around him team and trying to figure out what they're doing. They're not, they did not appear to be interested in being in the LeBron business. So whether it's the Knicks or another option, as you know, most of the time with a high profile player, if there's going to be a change in the next chapter, a lot of times by this point in the year, we're already hearing pretty loud noise about that being real. Like this is a real option. That's a real option. There is not that option currently for LeBron on top of that, to his credit. And this kind of goes to the 40,000 point thing. He, he has played well enough 
beyond well enough to help Jeannie Buss and the Lakers avoid what potentially I think could have been a very uncomfortable partnership because if his game did fall off, she's pretty shrewd. And I do think if he was, if he was garbage, if just bad way of putting it, if he, if he fell apart and then came Colin for 60 million a year on a new deal, uh, I think a world does exist where she would look at it and say, I don't know if I want to be in the LeBron business anymore. If, if, you know, if he's a market value, $15 million guy and I, and I got to give him one sixty four, if that makes sense but he's playing so damn well that he's made it a hell of a lot easier to stay in the LeBron business. And even if it doesn't mean title contention um, it, and you just hit on this, like it is better than the alternative. And this is a terrible analogy. I'm going to throw it out there anyway, but like you, you know, Vegas uh, traffics in, in, in high profile singers who find a home, you know, Adele, Billy Joel, all these different acts, right. Where like, the, the whole point is you go to Vegas, you see somebody whose talents you enjoy. And even if they might not be what they were in their heyday, um, it's worth paying 80 bucks to go see him or whatever it might be. Like LeBron has kind of become that, but it's, and I'm not, but it's, it's a really good version of that. And the Lakers, I think are looking at it going, man, you're, you're making history uh, routinely with the Lakers Jersey on um, you're legitimately entertaining for the fans, you, you are winning games. A lot of the nights when they lose, it's not your fault. It's, it's other guys. Um, he's just making, I think this whole relationship easy to, to envision it continuing. And, you know, I mean, again, at this age, we'll see how does he look next year? Is it a calculated risk to give him that contract? Of course it is. But, um, you know, it, it's not Kobe coming off an Achilles. I mean, this is a guy who, you know, I think you put it at top 25, top 20 player. Like he's, He's still there and and he's, you know, we know with the cap and the inherent nature of the way the league works, you know, the, the, the top guys don't get paid what they actually deserve anyway. Um, so I'm with you. I think if it continues this direction, you know, you pay him, you, you take the LeBron thing to the end and, and he'll go down in history as, as, you know, one of the greatest players of all time, if not the greatest, having done that final chapter pretty well with the Lakers. They, they, you, you, you missed. Said you weren't changing your mind on the goat debate, but uh, I said if I not, said, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I told uh, you, man. Touch two on, stories, brother. Two stories. Uh, let, let's touch on Lakers Warriors uh, player poll, and then and then I'll get you out of here. You've been very kind with your time. Uh, so Lakers and Warriors play on Saturday. This is basically like a, a second chance for the Lakers. They get two days off again, uh, so they're off Thursday. They're going to practice Friday. I don't think they're going to have shoot around on Saturday just because it's an earlier game. It's a ABC Saturday showcase game. Uh, but this is a, a huge matchup, even bigger than the Kings one, just because the Warriors are directly behind the Lakers uh, in the standings. They're, they're tied in the loss column, but they're, they're two games back in the win column. If the Warriors win this game, they have a 2-1 edge in the season series. They do play one more time in LA, uh, but they would jump the Lakers in terms of percentage points. Uh, they, they'd be one game back in the win column, but one game ahead in the loss column. Um, so just quick thoughts on this game, the, the significance, how LeBron and Steph, you know, several years later, just continues to be a thing like that. You, you had all the finals battles. You had the 2021 play in tournament you had last year in the conference semifinals. Now you have this showdown again, looking like. They're gonna have to play each other a couple times. Then they likely will be matched up in the playing tournament unless one of these two teams can jump the other one. Uh, the Warriors are playing well since that double overtime thriller against the Lakers. Uh, they have the fourth best record in the league. They're starting Draymond at center. They're, they're playing much better. They, they kind of figured out a new identity. Uh, so just overall, your, your thoughts on on this matchup and the significance of it? Yeah, I mean. You know, like we said earlier, um, the star power with Steph against LeBron is is fun and all, but you know we'll see if it ends up being a play in only type of matchup. But uh, two teams full of proud, still talented stars that 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 you know are disappointed at this point. You know, Steph Curry's ankle injury shouldn't keep him out much longer, um, but they've stumbled since he's been out. I think they're one and three since that injury, um, and they you know it's funny because they have found something with some of their young guys, you know, Jonathan Kaminga is, is a real player. And Brandon Pajemski is a real player. They get Andrew Wiggins back after his personal absence. Um, you know, I think Draymond missed last night's game against Dallas, but, um, 
all in all, it, it's just been a season of of teasing their fans, and, and again, somewhat analogous to the Lakers' experience, where you know if you squint hard enough at different points in the season, you can see where they maybe actually make big time noise, um, and and then they fall off. So that you know that matchup will be fun. Um, I can't get enough of seeing Steph and LeBron on the court together. Uh, and this is a longer conversation for another pod, but you know, in general, this has been hitting me lately how it's pretty wild how you have so many players from that like 35 year old and up age that are just getting near the end. And so whether it's Steph and LeBron, you know, you go to the other LA team, you know, even the, the Kawhi's and the Paul George's and the James Harden's, you know, I was just actually talking a long time bulls writer, Casey Johnson, you know, jump out to Chicago and DeMar DeRozan. Like there's a whole era of future hall of fame, incredible ball players that are not going to be around that much longer. So as it relates to Steph and LeBron, you know, I'm here for it. Uh, I certainly hope that Steph plays on Saturday and, uh, and that is must see TV, especially with, of course, the, the subplot a few weeks back of, of the Warriors, you know, calling uh, about LeBron and, and envisioning a world where Steph and LeBron might play together. Um, you know, that if you want to take anything away from that beyond the trade rumor aspect, it's the fact that, these two longtime rivals have reached a point in their careers and their lives where the mutual respect, you know, is kind of trumping the, the, uh, the kind of the edginess and the competitiveness that was there during all the Cavs and Warriors years. And, and that's kind of cool to see is, you know, the game recognized game component that, uh, that is there between the two of them. So should be fun. Um, and, uh, you know, the ratings, I think it will probably be, very much to the league's liking. I mean, people love watching those guys play and, and with good reason. Yeah, and I think, you know, Mike Brown obviously comes from the the Golden State coaching tree, although he was previously a head coach, but was there for several years, was part of the championships and clearly took some of the the offensive ingredients that made them so successful and has applied them very well in Sacramento. And that's where I'm, I'm interested from like an X's and O's perspective of, it's not quite the same thing. Steph is different than De'Aaron Fox and, and Draymond is different than DeMontis Sabonis. And we don't know technically yet if both guys are playing. I, I would assume so. Uh, the, the Lakers have a, a running internal joke that uh, every time a star is out, they magically get healthy for the Lakers game. And then you, sure. you'll see like there, there have been a few guys who like, they're out for several games, they play against the Lakers, and then they're out for several games again. And that, that's happened multiple times this season. Uh, so I assume Steph and Draymond are both going to be playing. It's a really big game. Uh, again, like potentially a season-defining game for, for both teams. Uh, but that that chess match of just uh, the, the Lakers' defense against the Warriors' offense and all the screening, all the movement, all the shooting, all the spacing, like how do they navigate that defensively? And then on the other end, it's another chance for Anthony Davis to redeem himself uh, in a, a smaller matchup. Uh, although Draymond defends him very well, and I, I think defends him arguably as well as anybody in the league, uh, can AD impose his will physically and, and just kind of control that game uh, on the offensive end? So it, it's going to be a fun one. And again, like the, the stakes, uh, I don't want to like overhype it or, or overemphasize it, but one team is going to have a 2 1 advantage in the season series one team is, is going to have an edge on the other in terms of place in the standings. And um, I think it really could come down to just like who has home court in that matchup in, in the play-in. Like that, that's the team that probably wins that, that game. So um, quickly to, you know, before we get you out of here, I want to talk about the player poll. So that's something that we've done at the athletic for the last few years. Now uh, you've been one of the people spearheading it and we're starting to do, the rounds of, of interviews of players. I spoke with a couple of Lakers players last night and, and had um, some fun interactions with them uh, about it. And I, I know we can't go into who we're talking to and, and, and what, but like, what, what can you share about the plan? Uh, I mean, the plan uh, plans on my mind, uh, sure, sure. <laughs> the player poll and uh, it, it just the kind of the, the, how the sausage is made with, with some of that and, and just, you know, your, your experience with it. Yeah, it's 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 one of the highlights of the year uh, for me. I think hopefully for the whole staff, it's one of those cool, very uh, athletic projects. Meaning, you know, we try to take you behind the scenes as much as possible and provide the kind of coverage that that you would not get anywhere else. And so, 
with anonymity comes candor. And that is obviously the incentive for granting that to the players. Um, and you're talking 15 questions and a bonus question where you have a, a nice mixture of generic stuff, which inevitably is the GOAT discussion is one of them, you know, who's the best player of all time. Um, but all the way down to more specific stuff, you know, I think this year has, has got elements of the 65 game rule and and more timely topics where you want to find out what these guys think of different issues within the league, um, what they think of their contemporaries, um, some of the more fun ones. You know, it's funny. Some of the ones that have a bit of a negative tone, admittedly, are sometimes harder to to compel the player to want to answer, but they also elicit the most interesting responses you know things like who's the most overrated player in the league and you know we're not trying to bury anybody here but like we all know that players privately like you're, you're trying to get as close as you can to to getting a, a pulse from the types of conversations you might get in the locker room because we all know players have these conversations like man why does the media hype up this guy so much i don't think he's actually that good or, or you know this coach is better than i think you know people give him credit for so it's that kind of stuff, um, you know, and, and it's a, a full staff project where everybody, and this is one of the nice benefits we have, is that when you have a, a robust NBA staff like we have, you got a lot of people in locker rooms where uh, we try to get as many voices on this thing as possible. I think last year we had 108 players. You know, you're talking about uh, about 25% of the league. Like that's a really healthy sample size to give you a sense of, of these opinions and, and, you know, and kind of at least feel like this is, it's not a player poll coming from five or 10 guys. It's a lot of guys in the league. So it's a fun read. I enjoy putting it together, uh, you know, and, and appreciate everybody's help. Uh, you know, Josh Robbins, our colleague is, it helps a lot with the, uh, the packaging of it and the, the collecting of it. And uh, I need to get on it, brother. I, you're already ahead of me when it comes to, to getting players I, this week, I'll try to get some, but as a quick aside, you can relate to, it is fun too selfishly because you know you are not only granting the anonymity but even when you guys file your answers to us you know we don't see who it is but personally you know you you learn stuff like about how guys see certain things and and you're not reporting who it is but you don't forget that stuff and um it is just it's fun to to get guys in a space where they are even more honest with you than normal i mean it and you know and sometimes it shapes the way you think about them or others going forward so that's kind of a side perk of the project but looking forward to it um no hard published date just yet but hopefully should be around playoff time at some point yeah no it, it's it's always fun I, I feel like for me it it kind of gives me a bond with the player where we have this like secret conversation almost uh where, where they could be totally candid uh in a way that uh, they can't typically be on the record or you know right. unless it's um you know, whatever, but, uh, yeah. And, and that, that, you know, I, I had a really good conversation with, with a player last night and, uh, the, the, just some, of, some of the answers that I got were, were hilarious. And like, uh, it was just interesting getting the, the, the peek behind the curtains in terms of like how, like what they, what they view for overrated versus underrated underrated is always, I mean, uh, overrated is always the, the one where like, uh, that, that that's a, like players don't want to bury other players at least in in the conversations i've had for it where the, that's the one where they get a little skittish but then typically we, we re revisit it at the end of the conversation uh but you know crowds and and the 65 game rule and like all these things uh, really spark some interesting dialogue in the locker room so it, it's it's a really fun project and i i know people are going to be looking forward to it uh whenever it drops but sam uh you Again, far too kind. We, we took up a lot of your time here. Uh, so just wanted to thank you for, for doing this, for being my second guest. You followed up, Austin Reeves. Uh, oh, so okay. Cool. I'm all right with that. Yeah. I'm all uh, right so, with that. So, can I, can I cap ahead. with, a, with a, uh, a fun story that fits in yeah. perfectly for you? Um, I don't even – I, I forget if I told you this. I told you this yesterday. The Austin story, um, does this ring a bell or no? no i don't think all so. right all right so i, I got to give the short version um and i'm trying to figure out make sure i frame it the right way so we uh for black history month at the athletic I internally uh some of my african-american colleagues and i ah uh, yes yes yes, yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. And and so That's I was great. nominated by the great Marcus Thompson to be part of a panel that was going to try to answer some some black trivia questions. Not gonna lie, I was trying to study, make sure I I came correct. Uh, there's a lot of pressure in that particular environment. <laughs> so we do it, and and I, I'm gonna ignore all the lowlights that I had, and I will highlight the one really good moment that I had. The question was which black musician had the most popular album of all time up until 2018. Uh, when they were surpassed by Journey's greatest hits. So immediately I'm going, okay, I got it. It's a Michael Jackson thriller, but it wasn't my turn to answer yet. So the three folks who go ahead of me, I will not say their names because I'll be throwing shade at their one bad moment. They didn't get it, get to me. I answer thriller and uh, to the relief of the masses, somebody at least got it. Friend, colleague, Marcus Thompson thought it would be hilarious on the back end of this Zoom call to produce the whole video of uh of this interaction so uh he sends me a clip and says hey you'll enjoy the two minutes where you get the thriller question correct and when i answer thriller he splices it with a video of austin reeves screaming i'm him i'm him <laughs> it's like the, just like the whitest moment in the history of the nba you know coming within the context of black trivia it was it was a lot but you know it was the closest that I'll ever have to uh, to be in Austin Reeves, and now that I know I followed him on your pod, I'm even more flattered. Uh, so I'm I might not be him, but I'm right behind him, something like that. <laughs> uh, so where where can people follow you? Read you? I hope that story made sense, people. It was pretty funny. I don't know if that would. I hope yeah. that that tape never gets released. Yes, although it would be it would be funny if it did. Uh, at all the normal places, uh, I, you know, X we're calling it, I guess, uh, Sam underscore Amy. I still call it uh, Twitter, Twitter, baby, Twitter, especially with the guy running it. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Sam underscore Amy, just go to the athletic, find us on there. Uh, as you know, you know, we enjoy doing our thing and, and telling good stories. Just click on that NBA page and, and browse around and, and you'll always find something great to run into and read. So. Thank you for having me on, brother. I appreciate it. Um, it was great seeing you in person last night. Appreciate you. Of course. Thanks, man.